I'm Sarah Bivens. And I'm Matthew Bivens. We had a home birth back in 2016. So we started a podcast about it. And then grew it into a birth brand to help future and current parents believe in their success with home birth. This is the place to hear home birth stories along with helpful resources and tips to feel empowered and supported in your birth journey. This is Doing It At Home. Hey team, welcome back to Doing It At Home. I'm Sarah. Today's episode is 36 hour Thanksgiving baby and the importance of trusting your birth team with Heather Davis and Chris Rusinko. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for tuning in wherever you are, however you found us. We are so grateful. So if you could hit that subscribe button on whatever device you are listening with right now, we would greatly appreciate that in terms of helping to get the show out there, people to learn more about us and get suggested in all the ways, you know, however that works algorithmically just hit that subscribe. We would really appreciate that. And then if you want to learn more about doing it at home, if you're new to the space, or if you've been around a while and didn't realize that there's more beyond the podcast, which there is, my friends, that is where it started. The podcast is where it started back in 2016, just over five years ago. We're going to celebrate the five-year anniversary of the show launch, actually the same week of Maya's birth in September. So that's really, really exciting. But That is how it started, but right now what it has grown to is just amazing and so humbling. So we have our Facebook community, our private Facebook group with 2,800 members, I want to say. Last I checked, we're getting close to 3,000 there. Our Instagram followership has grown tremendously as well. Our email newsletter and the things that we've created along the way beyond the podcast, like our book, which is now available in paperback on Amazon. And let me just say on a personal note, that very much felt like a birth all in itself (laughs) from conception, from first thinking about writing this book, which was about four years ago. So it was about a year after our home birth that I really sat down and started formulating the book and then, you know, hashtag new parent life, you know, and entrepreneurship and working from home, really just finding hours where I could write. And so I remember very distinctly one day a week for a number of months getting up before the rest of the house did, you know, I was still nursing. So I would get up before Maya got up, I think around five or five 30, And I would go plant myself at a coffee shop near our house and I would write for as long as I could before I had to get home and do the daily thing and do the routine and everything. So it's certainly been a labor of love writing this book. It is a combination of our experience and our story from switching to home birth from our originally planned hospital birth about halfway through the pregnancy. So chronicling that entire experience from making the choice, going back and forth, you know, soul searching, not sure if that was the thing to do to then sharing with friends and family and the mixed bag of reviews that was to moving through the fears and the doubts and building the confidence and formulating our team. So it's all of our experience as well as all of the patterns that we've been able to extract from the thousands of hours we have had conversations about home birth and hearing people's home birth stories. So really becoming researchers in in, in the world of, of home birth and learning from those experiences to put together what we've found as effective practices and ways to plan for and prepare for your home birth so that you can feel confident, prepared, and excited for it. So that's the book and written again over the course of a couple years, you know, put together, edited, and then finally made the choice to put it up on Amazon. And I don't know, just with the way the world has been recently, there's a lag time on pretty much anything out there. So from submission to Amazon to when it was actually available in paperback was over a month. And so I was in there just checking daily, you know, when is this thing going to be up and emailing back and forth with Amazon support and them just telling me to hang tight. There's basically nothing we can do. So all of that to finally have it up there is such a like huge, huge relief and also so exciting. And to see you all receiving your books is just really a dream come true for me personally. And then it's, it's just also so exciting that it's out there and it is helping and supporting others to prepare and plan for their home births and to do it in an empowered, confident, beautiful, magical way. So 
when you order your book and you receive it. Please snap a photo of you reading it out in the wild or when you receive it and tag us. I would so love to see that and share that in the community. So some of you have been doing that already and it's just, I can't even express the joy that it brings me. So Yes, yes, that is the book, Doing It at Home, available in paperback on Amazon. And fun fact, we have evolved our Instagram handle, so we are actually now doing it at home. So it used to be D-I-A-H podcast for a really long time, or basically since we created it. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we are more than the podcast now. So it just felt right to take that step, if you will, into the next evolution of doing it at home, because as the community has expanded, as the brand continues to grow and evolve, it just made more sense to be doing it at home rather than DIAH podcast on Instagram. So to follow us, go search doing it at home and give us a follow there and tag us in all the things when you're receiving your book. And when you're listening to let us know when you're listening and what you're listening to. We love to see that, you know, what episodes are circulating and what uh, what you're listening to that day and what you do when you listen. I love to see when, you know, maybe you're on your walk, maybe you're driving around in the car, just hanging out at the house, working out, you know, whatever you're doing. We love to see it. So getting back into today's episode, it was a really great one because we have mom and dad to share the story and share the experience. And I believe I've shared this in the past couple episodes, but we are now doing video format of our interviews. So you can listen to this right now in audio format, and you can also check out the full length version of the video interview. And we've also been splicing up the interviews into small clips on our YouTube channel so that you can just get little bites of it, little snippets, if that's what you have time for, and maybe go back later and watch the whole thing or come back to the podcast. Really just a way for you to get more home birth awesomeness and more oxytocin boosts. That's what we're here for. We're serving them up daily, y'all. So come get them and go to the YouTube channel to check that out and to see the video version of this episode as well as all of our future episodes. And that's just doing it at home. So go search doing it at home in YouTube and you can see all of that there for you because not only do we post our episodes in video format, but we also do videos of our life, our experience, our coaching, things related to home birth and beyond. So Check that out, folks. Okay, the episode with Heather and Chris, such a beautiful couple. Really appreciate their energy and the time that we spent with them. We talked about so many things, but I'm just going to hit the high points for you. We talked about the business of being born and the effect of that and the impact of that. I think so many of us can relate. We talk about their birth plan, their birth team, pain management or comfort measures, as we also refer to it. We talk about intimacy in labor and birth, a really great topic. Spinning babies, meconium in the waters when they break, as well as postpartum transfer. So we're going to have a quick word from our sponsor, and then you're going to hear our conversation with Heather and Chris. Hey, Heather and Chris, welcome to Doing It at Home. Hello. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we're so excited to have you both here today. So once again, we appreciate you hanging out with us today. <laughs> we're happy to be here on this beautiful day. It's beautiful where we are. I hope it's beautiful where you are. Same. Oh, yeah. A little humid, but hey, it's, it's, we'll it's take it. Good. <laughs> we dig it. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about yourselves and your family? Yeah. So um, I'm Heather, and this is my partner, Chris. Um, we've been together 10 years this month, actually. Um, we're also kind of high school sweethearts. Yep, first met in high school. Who had a pause of five or six years and then had a second round that went a lot better than the first round. Um, and we have a beautiful eight-month-old uh, daughter, Eliana, um, who was born at home. And um, yeah, we live in outside of D.C. in Arlington, Virginia. I work in education, um, and Chris works in arts in the gallery world, and uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. That's who we there you are. go. In uh, a box. Beautiful. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so you have an interesting history with home birth. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I was born at home. My mom has had three kids, um, and uh, my they were all planned to be at home. My older sister was a month early, so she was born in a hospital, totally fully cooked and ready, just came early, and so they had to go to the hospital. Um, but the other, my, myself and my brother were born at home in the 80s. So um, actually growing up, whenever we played that game, Two Truths and a Lie, my my truth, one of my truths was always I was born at home and nobody ever chose that as a truth, you know, because it was just like, so oh, wow. not, out there. I didn't, I didn't know anybody else who was born at home, yeah. you know, growing up. 
So um, it was kind of like my fun fact that I would share with people. So yeah. And I, you know, my mom, I, I asked my mom recently, like, how did, how did you decide to have a home birth? And mm-hmm. she, she doesn't remember, like she was, she was part of that circle of just crunchy people. And I, I don't know, I think she, yeah, that's what she chose. And my dad was on board and um, yeah, so I, I, there isn't really a cool journey to home birth for her. It's just kind of like she was in the, that circle and it made sense to her. Yeah. Um, so, but for me, you know, I, I, I always thought it was a really cool option. You know, I think I, I grew up kind of feeling like pregnant women are not sick and, you know, so hospitals are kind of an odd choice, I guess, you know, and I, and I also saw birth as like the, really like one of the coolest things that the body can do. And so I was always kind of enamored with this idea of, you know, having a birth at home and, and something I knew I wanted, it wasn't even a, I mean, it naturally just kind of came up in conversation because he knew it was something I was passionate about, just kind of home birth. My sister also had two kids at home. Um, uh, so I was able to attend two home births in my early twenties, oh, wow. um, which I think was probably pretty unique. Like, and then after, actually before we had Eliana, I attended two births in the hospital with midwives. So by the time I was pregnant and having a baby, I had been at four births, which I think is pretty not, not common that people have had that experience. So, and I remember at my, at my nephew's birth when I was 19 at home, um, he came out and I just like, my world just exploded. I was just like, this is the coolest thing that can happen. And if everybody could experience this, the world would just be a much more peaceful place. I just felt like people need to experience the power of what just happened. You know, it was, yeah. So it was very transformative for me. And, and actually the midwife who delivered myself and my brother delivered my sister's two kids too. So just like such a tight knit, I don't know, kind of warm feeling around, around birth and around being at home for birth and, and midwives, you know, just kind of, um, you know, kind of facilitating that experience. So yeah, I guess I'm a birth junkie-ish person, I guess you could say. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. We are in great company. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's such yeah. a cool history for, mm-hmm. you know, with, with home birth. And I think the fact that you attended all those births oh. prior to yours is incredible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, um, it definitely shapes, you know, shaped kind of who I am and the, and the thoughts and values I have around birth. And, and it, you know, it's always, it's something I would openly share with people too. And, and whenever I, w- if I was ever like watching something on TV that showed a hospital birth and just people screaming in panic, I'd always be like, this is BS. You know, yeah. I'm like, yeah. it's just, this is not, I hate that this is the one narrative that's shown, you know, publicly about what birth is like, you know, yeah. it's just not like that all the time. And yeah. I wish people could see, you know, the, the beauty, the calmness, the power, you know, that's like, it could be too. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I think it's something people know that I, I like and talk to me about. So. I, and I wouldn't say I was hard to convince, no. um, but you can clearly see that there's passion. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that passion was also something that really helped me feel comfortable uh, in supporting us in making this decision. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I wasn't hard to convince at all. Um, but yeah. it, it was this, like this passion, uh, and this idea of like being at multiple births and stuff that made it really mm-hmm. comfortable for me. And it's more just like hearing stories, I think, which really has a big impact on, um, uh, cause I have no experience with home births. Like my parents were like, what, <laughs> what are you thinking? And my dad worked for the department of health and human services. Uh, and he, he did work on a program that focused on, uh, infants and he was, you know, he, he was very worried. We'll say that, Mm. (laughs) but we, we sued him and and he was, he was eventually fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's Uh neat. And so I'm just thinking, you know, you said you weren't hard to convince with your history, Heather, like, is that a first date conversation? Is that like, (laughs) Hey, just so you know, I'm on track for home birth or is that, (laughs) we do this this is how it's going down right I mean honestly I feel like it did probably come up pretty naturally because my uh when we got together my uh was Amelie born yet my niece I mean she was like two years my sister was like in the throes of pregnancy again and having a home birth so the idea of home birth was was very much in our world Mm -hmm. you know even before we had talked about having kids so I don't know if that influenced you at all but it definitely was in our environment. Yeah. yeah early on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would say I'm open-minded in general. So yeah. it wasn't something that, you know, and we, and we, I had watched, I had watched the business of being born before we had even started talking like yeah, 10 years that's ago. True. Yeah. So, um, 
yeah, I already had some exposure to, uh, you know, that Netflix documentary Mm -hmm. life was something I lived for a little while. And that was one of the more interesting documentaries that I remember watching. Mm -hmm. That one is so influential. Oh, yeah. It's so many people who, who, you know, we talk to. A lot of things have shifted after they watched it. Yeah. Because it was just also so available. Mm -hmm. Like it was so out there and accessible and, and, you know, well promoted and... I think that has a huge impact on things. Like it was, it almost felt mainstream in a way. Like, oh yeah, for Netflix documentary. Yeah, at sure. That time, many years ago. Yeah, for sure. What were your thoughts on planning for your birth? Then going into it, were there some things you knew you wanted, knew you didn't want, given you know your experience and kind of born into yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. So honestly, the whole birth plan piece was. Um, it didn't, it did not come intuitively for me because I kept coming back to this feeling of like, I've never done this before. Mm. Like, how am I supposed Mm. to know what I'm going to like and what I'm going to need? And so maybe that was good because it helped us kind of really brainstorm big and, you know, well, let's think of what we could possibly do, you know? So we did opt to have a birth pool or birth tub in our house. Um, but I wasn't set on a water birth. I was like, if I happen to be in the tub and it's time, cool. If not, that's fine too. Like, I'm kind of like, let's have it here in case I want it, you know? And, um, but I, I guess I was really open to trying different things. Like I remember we tried a TENS unit at one point okay. with the electro stimulation and I was like, Mm-mm, get that off me. I don't like that. You know? So I just, you know, I was open to stuff. I think in, in naturally kind of happened, um, that I, I just gravitated towards Chris. I wanted to be physically touching him the whole time. And I didn't actually use a, like, I thought I would use sound a lot and have music on. I don't even remember the sound or the music at all, you know? So I don't know. I tried a bunch of different things, but the planning of it was very much like, let's just put a lot of stuff down and have a lot of options. And then, you know, my team will know what my options are and offer different things. And I think I I felt comfortable saying yes or no, you know, um, in the moment to take, you know, try things. So. And I remember talking about the team a lot too, like yeah. who is going to be there. I think yeah. that was something that was more on your mind and yeah. on our minds just generally. It was like, it's COVID, you know, right. there's pandemic considerations, yeah. uh, you know, what does the team look like? Who's going to be there? That was something that I think was very clear from the beginning. Like, I think, feel like that's kind of where we started in some way. It was like, who's going to be there? Who do we want to be there? Yeah. Um, that was probably more important than the what will yeah. happen is who's there. Yeah. I think that's great. So one thing that I heard is have the options available. That's that's a big thing that comes up in our community and I see in our in our conversations or whether it's social media, yeah. you know, do I have the tub? Do I have the tens unit? Do I have whatever right. the things are? And especially right. if you haven't birthed before, I am all right. for have it there. Better to have it there and not use it yeah. than wonder right. if it could have been the thing that helped you most. So I yeah. love that you mentioned that. And then I also love that the team is so important. The energy, the the people yeah. who are in the room, the people who are on board really makes a difference in terms of the the support that you have. So I love that those are two big elements here as we go along yeah. the story. Oh yeah. And and I will say too my the frame of mind that we had, you know, people say what do you need about pain, you know, and I would always say well my comfort measures will be, you know. So just I always had that kind of, you know, it wasn't pain management, it was comfort measures. Mm. And then for the team, I think, you know, we, um, my sister is a doula actually. I mean, she's currently actually in nursing school to become a midwife, but by that time, by the time of the birth, she was not in, or or yeah, she was still in school, but anyway, she, um, had a lot of experience with birth, you know? And so I think that was, you know, having her here was really important to us. My mom being someone who had, um, kids at home was important. And then we had, uh, we actually ended up having nine people, which is more than I thought we would have, honestly. And then it just, and we don't have a big house. So I was kind of like, gosh, is it going to feel like super crowded up in here? But um, yeah, they did a great job at just protecting my space. And and um, the only time I felt like I was being washed was when I was in the birth tub, which might have been why I didn't like being in the birth tub. But um, other than that, like you couldn't have I didn't know there was all these people here, you know, so that was important, I guess. Yeah. yeah, we had like the best friend photographer, yeah. the best friend who's two births that Heather had been yeah. to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, our midwife had her sister. Yes, her sister, who was a kind of midwife in training, mm. came to along with, along with a birth assistant who's also a midwife in training. So we had a stacked team. I felt super safe and super 
supported. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was, I think that was a big part of the preparation too, was just meeting people that, you know, we weren't familiar with and getting to know them more and building that trust. Yeah. Because I think for me throughout the process, building that trust was so much more important than like, you know, this specific thing or this, this other specific thing. Like, you know, I left that more up to, to Heather, but for me to feel comfortable and support, it was really about like having trust and yeah, all the meetings that we had with people went so far into building that trust. Um, so whether it was meeting with the midwife or meeting people who had um, been with that midwife before and were back again, like, you know, all that was just really helpful for me. Had everybody who was on your team, had they all attended home births before? No, actually, um, my uh, my sister and my mom had, but the other, the friend of ours who, who we asked to be our photographer had not. Um, and she's actually, she used to be a roommate of ours. Um, and so when we asked her, we took her out to dinner and we're like, you know, we have a question for you. <laughs> like we know you're, she knows us and she knew I was going to have a home birth. We're like, will you be the photographer? And, and she was like, so like honored and she was so sincere. She like spent the next like few weeks, like doing all this research about home birth photographers nice. and like what to look at you. Cause she, she's an amateur photographer, but you know, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, she says it was one of the most, yeah, impactful experiences she's ever had being there and um, just clicking away. So it was really cool to have her in this space and to let her experience that. I know she wants kids in the future and regardless of what she does, you know, how she wants to give birth. It's like, I was happy to give another person that experience of yeah. like being at a home birth, you know, um, and just seeing the power of that. So especially was, somebody so close to us. Yeah. Somebody we, we love dearly. So it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the impact that being at all those births had on you, it's a beautiful gift to be able to give somebody else. Yeah. I think that is exactly how we were thinking about it. Yeah. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I want to hit on the building trust element for a second because with the team, because I see a lot of questions out there in the community on, you know, who's going to make the cut and how, yeah, how to right. decide that. So if you could just offer a point or two or some feedback, if someone is wondering, should this person be at my birth or not, what you would offer to kind of make that choice, what those, what those delineating factors could be. I think for me, it was about, um, people that I did not have to worry about hosting, you know, like mm. in yeah. any capacity, like, I don't, I don't want Chris or I to have to be thinking about like, Oh, are they comfortable? Do they know where the bathroom is? Do they need food? You know, just like yeah. these people need to be able to like hang. What is that term? Stand alone kind of mm -hmm. thing, you know, just like, and, um, read the room, you know, yeah. <laughs> you need to be able to read the room and take, take direction. You know, I think we had, you know, my sister there being a doula, like that was her experience. You know, she, that's part of what doulas do is they protect the space, right. Of like whatever the couple wants. So I think my sister was very instrumental. And there was a few times where there was like some laughter happening that I didn't actually hear. But when people tell the story back, like my mom apparently was very giggly <laughs> during labor when I would like make noises and stuff. And there were people, my sister tells me like, I was constantly having to tell mom, like, Shh, stop laughing or like, go to the other room, get downstairs. And I didn't hear it at all. So just, you know, as long as there's somebody there who, who can really help protect that space. Um, and doesn't mind really kind of being direct with people. I think that's a good person to have maybe. Um, I feel like trusting your gut is, is a yeah. really big part of that. And I know that's not a very good answer because it's not very specific and people have different levels of like how they build that out for themselves. Yeah. Um, but for me, it was, yeah, it was something that did not come with like one meeting or two meetings, but mm -hmm. you know, as we met more with our midwife and then our midwife was like, can I bring my sister? You know, she's training this type of thing. Like, because I had so much trust in our midwife yeah. and we had built our relationship, I was like, okay, well, I trust her to make a good decision about who to be there. And then we were able to meet them. So if there was somebody that, you know, was going to be there that you had not met, but like definitely meet everybody who's going to be there. Yeah. Like I would say that for sure. But um, I think a lot of it was just trusting my, my gut. And because I feel like too, during the actual process, so many things came down to that. Like so much of it was about, being trustworthy and giving trust and, and receiving trust. And like a lot of it for me functioned around that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the, um, you know, it's, I don't want this to come off selfish, but like it was my, it was my experience mm. to shape, you yeah. know? And I think Chris really let me have that. 
and let me really take the reins on that, that this, those decisions. And, and I felt comfortable, not initially, but, you know, as I got closer to birth, I felt a lot more confident in sharing with everyone, like, like, for example, my mom and my sister were kind of beefing, like leading up to the birth. And I was like, you know, at first I was like, how do I make them get over this before I have, because I need them both there and I can't have them, you know, bringing that energy into my birthing space. Yeah. And for a while I was like, how do I fix this? But then eventually I was like, you know what? It's not my job to fix their relationship. Like I just need to be clear about what I want at my birth and, and ask them, can they do that? You know, can you both be there and support me? And they said, yes. And they were able to do that. So it was really more about me being able to express what I wanted you know, and being able to share that with people. And then when, you know, people were luckily, you know, really receptive to that and were able to, you know, provide that. But I think if someone had been like, mm, I don't know, I would probably would have been like, then I, you can't be there, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I think birth being pregnant was such an incredible experience and just like developing my own voice and listening mm -hmm. to my body mm -hmm. and just like developing more confidence, you know, in who I am and what I want. So yeah, I think that's part of choosing your team is just trusting your gut. Like, what, what am I feeling about this person? Can I express what I want to them? Mm -hmm. you know, will they hear me? You know? Yeah. And being clear about expectations, yeah. Like, yeah. like super clear about expectation setting. And even if it's not super specific, because that right. expectation will evolve yeah. over time. And so, yeah, if you can at least be a little bit general, then you're building like that first layer of trust that you can build on as you go through the process and understand more like you being whoever out there is going through it. Yeah. Such a great conversation because I know that there's, you know, people who feel like they are obligated to mm -hmm. invite certain individuals, family members, right. friends, like, oh, okay, I'm having this home birth and I'm choosing to have multiple people. So I guess I have to bring this person along. And, you know, what yeah. I love from the two of you sharing is it, is it no, that's not, doesn't have to be the case. You know, yeah. you, you feel the energy of that person. Are they going to add to the room? Are they going to add to the experience? And yeah. if they are, great. If not, you know, you don't have, it's like you said, Heather, it's your experience. Yeah. And so you get to to choose. And I also love that there's elements of, you know, speaking your voice, advocating for yourself, being clear, being courageous with your words, all are such wonderful yeah. things to to practice. And it sounds like you both really leaned into those opportunities. So I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I heard you had a similar experience when I listened to your your episode. We so. certainly yeah. did, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and again, I'm glad that we we you know stood up for ourselves, so to speak, and advocated for yeah. ourselves and spoke clearly because it rippled. It rippled through yeah. those people in our lives, and you know the the stance that we took for ourselves and and all of those things. The impact of that is still felt today, and you know the the mutual trust and respect and all of those things are still felt today. And that was five years yeah. ago, mm -hmm. and so it's yeah. you know it goes Incredible. beyond just the birth experience. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I think it is a good lesson for life, and whether it's your birth or it's it's elements of your your family experience, do not give someone VIP access who is acting like a nosebleed section person. <laughs> That's what comes up for me. Like, do That's not great. give someone the backstage pass when how they're showing yeah. up. They yeah. need to be a little yeah. further back. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah, that's what I comes like up for me. The parent, this, I mean, the whole parenting journey has been like that, too. You know? Sure. It's like yes. Learning how to just be confident in our in our choices and set, set boundaries and expectations and, yeah. you know. And also know where productive conversations are going to happen and where, you know, we're not going to have a productive conversation yeah. and, and so also true. knowing when sure. to kind of like cut yeah. something off. If, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard an expression, you know, the expression, choose your battles. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, my, my sister said she heard recently, don't know. It's not choose your battles, choose less battles. Oh, uh, I'm like, yeah. yeah, I'm like, totally. That, I like that. Just choose less battles. I, like I agree. That. So I think that applies too to these conversations sometimes. Yeah. Mm hmm Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, walk us through the birth experience. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell us about birthing time. So, all right. So my guest date was two days before Thanksgiving. Fun. And cool. um, yeah. And um, my sister lives in Charlotte. So it's about six hours from us. And so, you know, a big part of like leading up to birth was like, all right, when do we tell Chloe it's time to come get in the car, you know? And she had been a doula actually for several other births in the DC area while living in Charlotte. So she was familiar with 
having to jump in the car at midnight and drive, you know, but we were really trying to avoid that because we didn't want her to miss the birth. So she, um, there was a lot of back and forth, you know, leading up to that week of, okay, how are you feeling? Should I come? Uh, you know, and it, and it was really stressful, you know, and finally we decided the Monday before Thanksgiving, she had one test to take that morning. So it was like, okay, just take that test. And then you're off for a week for Thanksgiving. So just come, you know, and if I don't go into labor, that's fine. At least you're here and we don't have to worry about it. So she arrived Monday night um, uh, before Thanksgiving. And then Tuesday on my guest date, I started to feel cramping. It was like, I was, she was there and I felt like my body was like, all right, we can start. You know, it was very mild. I think we even like, I was not like in football and contractions, just kind of really hanging out that day. I think we even went out to get breakfast. Like it was pretty normal. Um, but then Tuesday night, um, in the middle of the night, I started to feel contractions about 10 or 15 minutes apart. Um, again, pretty manageable. Um, but, uh, one of the comfort measures we had wanted to try from, um, orgasmic birth was, you know, some intimacy. So, uh, we took advantage of that and just enjoyed, you know, the early, early morning contractions together in bed. And, um, then Wednesday, that was Wednesday morning, then the day before Thanksgiving, since I'd had some contractions, we called our midwife story and just told her what's going on. And she was like, great, you know, sounds like your body's doing what it's should be doing. And so your goal today is to rest and hydrate and eat. And I was like, okay, so I can do that. And shortly after that, uh, that phone call in the morning, I lost my mucus plug. So I was like, all right, again, then we, we updated her again. And so that day was basically me in and out of bed, trying to nap, you know, and eat when I could. And, but then by Wednesday night, um, the contractions had gotten stronger, but they had totally moved to my back. And I knew from our preparation with spinning babies that that could be a sign that the baby was not in the best position anymore. And so when we called the midwife to check in, you know, she recommended some spinning babies exercises, you know, and then also just reassured us like this, this happens, they usually, you know, baby usually, you know, kind of adjusts itself back. And so again, the goal tonight is to rest and hydrate. And if you want to take a Benadryl to help you sleep, you know, go ahead and do that. And so Chris and uh, Chloe helped me do the exercises and I, I did opt to take a Benadryl and then got in bed. And, um, and then about 4 AM, I think I started yeah. to feel they came back with a fierce, yeah, intensity. And it was all of a sudden like four minutes apart. And so for an hour, we timed it together in bed. And then after an hour, I was like, okay, I want story here now. <laughs> I was mm. like, call the midwife. And, uh, it was really cool because like Chris, you know, reached over to pick up his phone and, right after I said that. And there was a text from story that said, I'm up. How's Heather had like just oh, came in. And I was wow. like, oh, she's so in rhythm, you know, with us. Okay. And so Chris called her and told her and about the same time, the birth assistant, Christine, who had been part of our um, appointments throughout the whole pregnancy too, had at the same time also texted story and been like, I just woke up and felt like I should be praying for Heather. How's Heather. And um, so I was like, oh, just like so struck by how in tune they were. And yeah. so shortly after that, you know, an hour or two later, they were there and setting up the birth tub. And um, yeah, and things hadn't advanced that much. So there was no like we were updating story or our yeah. midwife and, you know, we were giving kind of the play by play and story was checking with in with us very yeah. frequently as she was getting together. So, yeah, I think before she got here, I had gotten to the point where I wasn't on the phone anymore. I was just like in those contractions. Yeah. Um, but then, um, when they were here, I was, they, I, my water broke in the living room uh, while everyone else was upstairs and it, getting the tub ready, and yeah, getting there. the tub ready, doing all that. I was with Chris downstairs and my water broke and, um, it was brown and I knew like, oh, that means meconium. Right. And that could be bad. And so they, it was pretty loud sound. And so they came downstairs and saw, and I just looked at story and I said, isn't this bad? And she looked at me so confidently and just said, you know, in rare cases, it means the baby's undergone some stress, but in most cases, it means the baby's just pooped. And she said, it's my job to worry, not your job to worry. Mm -hmm. And I just was able to let go of like that kind of fear and just keep, you know, laboring. And, um, well, yeah. that was a point that we came back to yeah. after the birth happened, yeah. uh, like a week later, we talked about that moment with story. Yeah. And, and this was where, this was a moment where that trust building really paid off mm -hmm. because in that moment, just based on how our midwife knew us, um, she was like, well, you know, in my head, there are people that I would say, do you want to go to the hospital? Like I would offer that option after, after that happened, but mm -hmm. you know, you wanted to have a home birth so badly but you were also so aware of, you know, everything that could happen and, and what could go wrong. That story was just like, you know, in that moment, like I need to just reassure and soothe and like, yeah. you know, 
And that was that moment where like the trust that we had built really paid off right. because we talked about it. And you had said something like, you know, if Story would have said that, that might, that would probably would oh, have yeah. thrown me. If she had said, about. maybe we should go to the hospital, I would have been like, oh, okay, then I trust you and we should do that, you know? Yeah. So I think she knew, you know, how to kind of honor what I wanted and that it, this wasn't an emergency and that we could just stay in this space. And yeah. And that you wouldn't react to it like it was an emergency kind of thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so after that, I was definitely like in the la labor land place. I was, you know, um, I, when I go back and look at pictures, I was like, oh, I did that. I was there. I don't remember mm -hmm. being in all over the house like that, but I was all over the house and um, in the tub. And and when the contractions got really strong in the tub, again, I felt like that was the one time I was kind of being watched because the tub was in a small room and the door was open to the hallway and everybody was like in the hallway. So I feel like there was just like all these people like looking at me, but also I just felt unstable. The contractions were so strong that I felt like I needed to be grounded, like mm. feet on the floor. And I just felt too floaty in the tub. So eventually my, one of my favorite birthing positions was sitting on the toilet with the squatty potty. So like knees up and it was just super comfy. And actually that is the one time that I got a check from story. Um, I, I had asked a little earlier, like, shouldn't you check me? And she was like, I can, you know, but nothing about what's happening makes me concerned. Like you're progressing. Things are going well. And yeah, I, and they had been monitoring heart rate yeah, and stuff like time. that the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I and I knew that like, you know, a dilation doesn't equal, you know, X amount of time left before baby, you know. So I was like, I don't want to mess with get get all messed up in my head by knowing that. So if you trust things are going well, then we're good. Let's keep going. But I had kind of been pushing some when I was on the toilet. And so she checked me and then she said, you know, if you put your finger in about an inch, you can feel your baby's head. And so I did, and I just lost it. Like, I just broke down in tears and like threw my head back. And it was just like a, oh, this is happening. You know, like yeah. I, for two days now, I've been feeling this stuff and not knowing like what's going on inside and like to know like, oh, there's the baby. She's almost or there. We didn't know yeah, it was a boy or girl. So like, baby, Aww. there you are. And it was just such a cool moment. Um, I treasure that moment so much that I was able to just kind of feel that, um, her head and, and feel her there. So yeah. And then, uh, shortly after that, we moved to the bedroom and, um, I was pushing for about an hour and a half. So not super long. Um, but I will be honest, I did, I, I always fully expected that labor would be one of the hardest things I've ever done. Like I was not under this impression, like, Oh, it'd be easy and fine. And I was like, no, it's labor. It's going to be hard. You know, I'm going to have to work but I did not expect to have to push as hard mm -hmm. as I did, mm -hmm. like just with the more force than I could have ever, that I ever knew I was possible, you know, of kind of, of, of manifesting. And um, so anyway, I was pushing it on my side for a while and the baby was coming, but it was kind of taking not long, a while, but story basically recommended, why don't you squat on the floor and have Chris kind of behind you on the bed? And I said, well, that sounds great. Cause I think the grounding thing came up yeah, again. Like I, like, that I idea. want my feet on the floor. And like, just to set the stage a little bit, like Heather was on her back on the bed. Our midwife had Heather's foot on her face, <laughs> like right here <laughs> and another foot on her body down here. <laughs> and I had a fan in my mouth and Heather was squeezing both of my hands and I'm like fanning her with a little fan in my mouth. <laughs> and through all of that we couldn't like you know she needed to like ground yeah, to push like, on so we yeah. were like That's i think we funny. need to move this summer because story and i were kind of like trying to push yeah. back but it wasn't you're too strong yeah yeah, <laughs> um, yeah we've all these great pictures of these moments um but as soon as i got into the squatting position like she came like mm -hmm. within a minute like two pushes she was out yeah like she i was, was i was behind you yeah and you had your kind of like elbows resting on my knees yeah and um she i was so close to the ground you know that the sto story caught her and just kind of placed her on the ground um because one of the things that we mm -hmm. wanted in terms of our birth plan was um, we had watched a documentary by Karen Strange. Um, she's a midwife and neonatal resuscitation expert and she really focuses on the baby's experience of birth and so we watched this um, video of hers about the baby's experience. And, you know, we really were cognizant of the fact that like the baby was going through birth too, that mm -hmm. it wasn't just my experience of giving birth, like this, uh, the baby and I were doing this together. And mm -hmm. so when she got here, we wanted to give her a moment, this like pause of like, rather than just immediately getting scooped up or immediately going. So we're just like, just, you just got here. Like, let's, and not just for her, but for me too, yeah. like this crazy thing just happened. Like, let me take a breath, you know? Yeah. And so, um, story knew that. 
So she just kind of directed her onto the ground and then um, she came out screaming and bright red, yeah. which is what you want. If there's any meconium present, just so there's, they know there's oxygen and, and breathing's okay. Um, and she was huge. She was nine pounds, one ounce, which we Oof. did not anticipate having a baby that big. Nice. Um, well, in, in, in that pause moment though, I think something that we talked about too was just, and everybody knew that that was part of the birth team. So everybody that was there was on the same page that there was going to be like this pause, but yeah. it was an open pause. It was like, we just want to give time for something to happen. And that something could be nothing, yeah. but that something could also be just immediately reaching down and picking up right. the baby. It's just, it was just kind of like, we don't want the baby to come out and people just like yelling and photos going yeah. off and like all this stuff, yeah. like all happening. We just wanted to have like a moment. A and, I, and I think it also naturally happened a little bit too, because we were, you know, we were worried about the meconium, but we weren't like, you know, absolutely terrified. But I think there was that moment too. And then the gender was another thing because like we had completely glazed over that. We were just like so excited. <laughs> yeah. And then somebody finally was like, wait, is it a boy or a girl? It a boy? And I was like, oh, it's a baby. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, but by the time I wanted to pick her up, um, her cord was so short so that I couldn't really pick her up. And and she was so slippery, you know, and so she kind of stayed there longer than I anticipated. And then eventually I was like, I really want to pick her up. And so I was like, you can just put her like right at your lower belly. So I was already squatting on the floor and she could only come up to my belly. So it was really short, but luckily again, within a few minutes, my placenta detached and came out quickly. So we were able to then stand up and, and get to the bed. Um, yeah, but it, and, and I, you know, I've, I've seen all these pictures of birth and the moments the baby comes and just the expressions on people's faces. And it's, I feel like I had this, um, I had wanted to also have this expression of bliss or, you know, whatever, of just like this magical moment that just happened. And all the pictures of me, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just like jaw dropped open, like exasperated, like I, in the, in the 12 minute video of like her birth and the next 10 minutes after, I think I say, holy shit, like 10 times. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, this baby just came out of me. I'm like, what just happened? Yeah. Like, I just was so blown away by what happened. And, um, which, but, but there was comedy. I remember um, one of the things that you said very soon after she came out was, Oh my God, she's got my thigh. Yes, I have, I'm an athlete, so I have big thighs. And I was like, oh, she has my chunky thighs. I love it. And so, yeah, it was just such a, yeah, it was not this like calm, blissful moment for me. It was like this like, holy crap, what yeah. just happened, you know? And and there was one moment afterwards that I, I voiced, you know, like there was moments there where I didn't think I could do it, you know? And everybody was like, you never, I could never tell, you know, like I had never expressed that during labor, but it was like, when she was finally here, I was like, wow, I can't, you know, just such, so I was just in awe, you know, of what just happened. And, um, and I, I also was just hopped on adrenaline and sure. oxytocin, you know, it was just, and I didn't, I, and I did not feel uh, the reality of the situation, which was that I had a fourth degree tear that she had come out and ripped me wide open. Ooh, and I mama. did not have any awareness wow. that that mm -hmm. happened. I was not in pain. Yeah. I was not, there was not necessarily an, uh, more blood that had indicated that like mm -hmm. it, it wasn't until I was laying down and, I, and story checked me that she was like, Oh, uh, you need to go to the hospital. And I was like, what, <laughs> you know? So that was quite a, unexpected turn for mm. birth to take sure um, and and yeah and luckily it wasn't emergent I didn't need to rush there I was able to actually spend about four hours with Eliana and Chris and have skin to skin and mm. start nursing do all that um but yeah that was super unexpected um to have to transfer after birth yeah yeah that's quite a record scratch moment I imagine yeah yeah um uh and it was Thanksgiving, so yeah, that it was, was interesting because yeah. the hospital was pretty empty. Yeah, there was a lot of um, things. There were that, a lot of things yeah. that made it really that made it easier okay. than I would have anticipated. And and I think the first being that our, my the midwife called the hospital and said, you know, this is we had this home birth, baby's fine, mom's fine, this this happened, we're sending her. The midwife knew knew the OB surgeon that was on call that day, you know, yeah. and so I felt like a VIP going to the hospital. Honestly, I was like, nice. you know, she, when I showed up, they knew I was coming, who I was, um, you know, and, and like Chris said, it was Thanksgiving. So it was empty on, in the labor delivery where I went to GW hospital in DC. And, um, 
yeah, I, of course I didn't want to go, (laughs) but you know, I really trusted my midwife and she said, you know, this, you know, if it was a first or second degree, like I could do it, you know, here, but this is a, this is the fourth degree and there's muscles and that have ripped. And if you want, you know, the best chance of recovery and of healing, like you really need to go to mm-hmm. the hospital. And, um, and then we debated who would go with me, you know, right. and who would stay with the baby. And originally I had, um, wanted my sister, the doula to stay with Chris and the baby and my mom to come with me. And then story and all her wisdom was like, mm, don't you want your doula to come with you to the hospital who like knows how to navigate hospital settings? Mm-hmm. And like, and I was like, oh yeah, that's mm-hmm. a great idea. Smart. And, yeah. um, in retrospect, my mom would have been a hot mess and not have known like what to do. So I'm so glad my sister came again, who just is a doula and, uh, yeah, was just really able to advocate for me when I was in such a vulnerable place you know, like hours after having a baby, having to just like leave my bubble of my home. And, and I was just crying on the way to the hospital, you know, and, um, and just left my baby with Chris and, you know, just so many unexpected things. And, um, I remember getting to the hospital and, and, um, going through, um, triage, you know, and, um, there was a small part of me that we had before we had left story said, you know, try, see if they'll do their, this, the, um, third or the repair, excuse me, in triage, mm. because then you'll get home faster. And I was like, okay. So we were like trying to push for that, you know? And then the surgeons were like, no, we need, we need the light in the surgery room. We really need to do this. Right. And so once I accepted that, like, okay, I need to be here. I need to do this. It was actually kind of an enjoyable experience after that, which I also didn't anticipate. Um, we had an incredible nurse who just didn't make me feel weird at all mm-hmm. about having a home birth and having to come to the hospital. She had had four kids herself in the hospital it was like, tell me your birth story. Tell me what's happening. You know, she, she was so warm wow. and welcoming and like really made my experience, you know, as painless and, and, and as it could have been. And, um, they let my sister come with me into the operating room. So she was just by my side the entire time. But I, you know, I got a spinal um, anesthesia. So I basically got an epidural after I had my home birth, which was crazy. Um, And uh, had an incredible team, you know, to stitch me up there. And uh, then it was just a kind of battle to get the anesthesia to wear off because that's, I had to be able to walk and pee before I could go home. So I was, my sister and I were a trip. We were like in triage, like, okay, let's try again. Like, give me, like, let me try and stand up. And like, I, we kept trying and I just kept not being able to do it. And, um, but again, the nurses could tell, like, she just wants to get home. So I had to pee and they're like, well, you can, we'll just bring you a bedpan. You can sit on it here and pee. And I tried to do that. It didn't work. I was totally numb. You know, I mean, they were just so funny, like trying to help me as get home as fast as possible, but it all, I was actually ended up being away for seven hours. So it was a long time to like leave a newborn baby and with her dad. Yeah. You know, and um, yeah. And so he got that really unique, challenging experience of like being with this newborn who was like, where's my mom? You know? Um, yeah. I had some colostrum in a syringe yeah. and I had uh, some milk from uh, one of our friends who had, uh, how old was this? Like, um, a friend of our, the friend who was at the birth, she had a, um, a, like a one and a half year old. Yeah. yeah. So she's still breastfeeding. So we had some milk from her oh, and wonderful. we had some colostrum from me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it was just, it was a lot of just hanging out and mm. skin to skin and we took a nap and that was really sweet. Mm. But as the, as time progressed, it became clear that like, I didn't have the things that, um, Eliana needed. And so like, yeah, I, I'll, I'll never forget. Like when she walked back into the room, like, uh, into the bedroom, cause I was in the bedroom with her and I like taking Eliana around the house a little bit. And, you know, we, we interacted and engaged and, you know, bopping her on the nose and stuff. She was like kind of smiling a little bit. Like, like it was super cute and super fun and it definitely a unique experience to yeah. bond with her in that way. And I, I loved every part of it, but I could tell that there was something that she needed that she wasn't getting. And I remember when Heather walked in and I don't like, you know, in terms of crying, like you haven't seen me cry, like very much. Like, I don't know. I, I don't cry that much, but there are times where I do. And like, that was definitely one of them. And uh, I remember just being so happy to see her when she walked in. Yeah. Um, but like you had been through all of this stuff and you got home and you just picked up Eliana and spent the next like three hours with her working to get breastfeeding going and all that kind of stuff. And it was yeah. just like, 
that's the point where I was like, well, you know, women are superheroes and <laughs> I just kind of sit here and, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Smile, <laughs> smile. And uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that was, that was another amazing moment, you know, kind of like through, through some of the hardships that we had gone through, I think we forged an even stronger connection with both ourselves and the birth process, our team and Eliana. So I think like, you know, the hardships and, and I'd say that's kind of like a mantra of ours generally is like we look at hardships as opportunities for breakthroughs and opportunities to have growth. Yeah, yeah like and a lot of growth kind of like fast forwarding your growth um and so that mindset was also really helpful and that's a mindset that I would say I had just throughout the whole process like going into it for me personally I I had a lot of trust in my team and I was just like, I'm going to do everything I can to support. Like in my mind, there's just like anything, you know, illustrated by the, the fan in the mouth and the hands here and like all this stuff. Um, but like, I just tried to be as close to her as possible the whole entire time and just listen to her and talk to her. And we, we had talked a lot beforehand about what we might want or need, but a lot of it was just me being convicted in like, I'm going to do everything I can to support and trust my team and like be like, that will make me feel good no matter what happens. Like I did the best thing that I could do. And so I, that was my like little tidbit of mental preparation. But that really came into play, I think, when I when Eliana and I were like alone and, I, yeah. you know, we were tired like, and we, we took that nap. But also I had this like conviction like, oh, I got to do the best. And so I was like looking for different ways to soothe her and just mm -hmm. like that all built up such a stronger relationship, I think, between her and I. And it was just a really unique experience that like I'll definitely cherish forever. But yeah. Wow. And then yeah. you come home and then there's like the completion, you know, there's like the yeah. restart of the golden hour, so to speak, you know, right. and you exactly. get to move into that zone. And uh, yeah. even with the the curveballs, you know, then you create that experience when you're all together. Yeah. When you yeah, that Karen Strange documentary uh, illustrated that. That like the golden hour can happen at any point yeah. kind yeah. of thing. Like don't feel like if it doesn't happen immediately that right. like you're out of luck or something like that. That's not how it works. It yeah. can happen in the first week, the first month, like just make it happen. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Heather, when you returned home, who was there? So at that point, um, I don't know if anybody else was there. I think I think for sure somebody was there because that was part of what I had requested. Like somebody stay with Chris. Like don't mm -hmm. have everybody leave. But the, but the midwife had gone by then. At that okay. time, Eliana was totally fine. Um, she was ten out of ten and all her Apgar scores and everything. Um, but I think maybe one of our close friends was still there, yeah. just downstairs. Like Chris was alone with her in the bedroom. People were there just in case he needed anybody. Cool. Um, and my, I guess my sister, my sister came home with me from the hospital and then she stayed with us for yeah. five days to oh, provide nice. some postpartum support. So she was there as well. Yeah. But yeah. It was just them. Mm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like the adrenaline, I got a, I got an extra dose of adrenaline with the hospital visit. So I just, I was just charged for probably the next 48 yeah. hours. I remember maybe two days later, I was finally like, oh, yeah. <laughs> come down. Okay. Yeah. Come now I can yeah. like breathe and like we're here and we're home and everything's okay. And you know. Well, and I would say all that work that we did to create the birthing environment that we created overlapped into, well, after you had left for the hospital and stuff like that, like I felt also that birth environment still happening around mm -hmm. me while I had Eliana. Yeah. So right. it was like that went even a step further and had a bigger, like, there were like remnants of that. I still feel like in relationships and in our space. And like, I think part of creating that safe and trusting environment was also um, like setting us up for success moving forward. Yeah. Like yeah. so much of all that work that went into that forwarded our relationship a lot. And I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't share this because Heather, we, we talked about this a little bit before, but um, for the other thing that I want to share from my perspective is that like, for me being like right because like the whole time heather and i basically have body contact um like she was holding my arm or something like that like at the very least or just like fully wrapped around each other and for me like birth was a really romantic experience like for me it was really like seeing seeing this happen like it it was so it was so beautiful and she, like you were working so hard <laughs> and i was just like oh my gosh i feel like i'm not doing enough and like i was just trying everything i i could think of but but for me and like you know for, for anybody else out there that's looking to support, like I just, for me, it was a really romantic experience because I was there to just do everything I could to, to try and be my best self and let 
you know, trust my team and that kind of thing. But that gave me the space to have this romantic experience Mm -hmm. where like, you know, I didn't, I wasn't worried that much about all of these specific things because I knew we had a good team and that opened up space for me, I think, to have this romantic experience of like, oh my gosh, this is like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Kind of, mm. it was, and so this is something else that we talked about sharing that I, I really yeah. want to share. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so in love with the both of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here just like, oh. I know all these birth photos is like Chris just like gazing at me lovingly and I'm like oh, I'm like making all these like hard birth faces and he's just like oh, she's so beautiful it's so funny goals though goals yeah. have a partner who will look at you in the throes of labor like that yeah. with that sort of affection and commitment and that that's it I'm so so yeah. excited for yeah. couples to listen to this together I will very much mm-hmm. recommend that as a preface with this conversation that couples listen to this together because, and then also watch this because there is another added element of seeing someone's face, sharing their birth mm-hmm. experience and seeing mm-hmm. the two of you do the dance again and, and have the, the organic responses and reactions in, in just your body language and everything. There's really something special to that. And, um, that's why I love hearing birth stories so much and everyone is so unique and I'm just so grateful for what you've contributed now into this space. And, and um, Heather, I know you said there were some resources that were helpful for you. So I want to make sure I get those from you and I'll put them in the show notes. So anyone yeah. who's interested in checking out anything that supported you, because clearly everything you did worked really well. And so this is a really great yeah. example yeah. for people to go off of. So I just want to extend our gratitude again. And thank you for being with us and joining us here on the show. Thank you so much for listening and yeah. Really. Creating the space for these conversations yeah. to happen because yeah, it's yeah. so, so important, especially for people who are on the fence about home birth, like just to be able to yeah. hear experiences, like that's what really helped me. And yeah. that's clearly what helped Heather and built the passion for this. So yeah. Yes. Normalize home birth. Yes. <laughs> that's what we're all doing. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. Quick note about the Doing It at Home podcast. Matthew and I are not doctors or medical professionals, and nothing we say should be taken as medical advice or opinion. If you have medical or health-related questions, please take them to a trained professional. We're here simply to entertain you with stories and conversations about pregnancy, birth, and parenthood.